Dennis Sarfate making his first appearance. What will you do to defend the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Welcome to the Green Dragon Tavern, where we talk a little treason. I'm Zach Lautenschlager. Dennis is unable to join us this week. Today is our Thanksgiving special. Lastly, and which was not least, a great hope and inward zeal they had of laying some good foundation, or at least making some way thereunto, for the propagation and advancement of the gospel of the kingdom of Christ in those remark parts of the world, yea, though they should be but even as stepping stones unto others for the performing of so great a work. Thus wrote William Bradford, the leader of the pilgrims. This was his account of the settlement of Plymouth, called Plymouth Plantation. And uh, it is a central part of the story that we sell, still celebrate uh, on Thanksgiving Day. This holiday, this concept of national days of Thanksgiving to the God of the Bible, is an historic fact. We may, some may disagree with whether or not the federal government should be declaring such holidays, and that's a debate we can have. I support it for two reasons. Number one, it is constitutional, uh, according to the framers. And number two, it is the proper role of both local and national governments to acknowledge God because they are his servants. Now, what about those who live in the nation who are not Christian? Well, uh, believe it or not, we've dealt with that before. And in fact, the pilgrims dealt with that question. One of the earliest uh, documents or, or instruments of government, the Mayflower Compact, dealt with exactly that question. Uh, that was one of the major things that they had to deal with. And so even that is and his, has historical precedence, and not just precedence, but overwhelmingly there is one way of dealing with that question in America. It is Marxists who want to change that. And I'm not saying that you are a Marxist if you don't believe, uh, for example, that the federal government should declare national days of thanksgiving to Almighty God, the God of the Bible. Um, but you are disagreeing not only with the vast majority of American history, you are disagreeing with America's founders, and you are disagreeing with uh, the people who arrived here and who were the first uh, Western uh, Americans. You're also disagreeing with the Native Americans who have lived here since the Western peoples arrived. And all of this is encapsulated in the story of the pilgrims, which is a fascinating story. Now, I started with that Bradford quote because it really does describe um, one of the, and perhaps the, according to Bradford, perhaps the most important reason why a bunch of Englishmen came to America. Now, they were certainly not the first Europeans, but they were some of the very first, and they were the among the very first to establish a lasting um, a habitation or colony or whatever you want to call it in North America. Um, there are a few others, but they did not have the influence. You could go down and say, well, what about the Spanish in uh, in, Al in Mobile, example, or in uh, St. Petersburg um, in Florida? Um, yes, we can talk about that. We can talk about the French that were there much later. Um, but the reality is that American jurisprudence and the way Americans have done things flows directly from Plymouth. That's why we have Thanksgiving Day. That's why it's about turkeys and funny hats. Um, so that's why we want to talk about that uh, the day after Thanksgiving and to hopefully dig into that a little bit and say, what is this and how does it work? Now, some of you may have the opportunity to watch this before Thanksgiving Day, and if you do, um, we encourage you to uh, tell these stories to your children. Do they know who the pilgrims were? Have you read from Plymouth Plantation? The great thing is most of it's available online. You can look it up on Google. Just type in William Bradford, Plymouth Plantation. You can type in William Bradford Stepping Stones, and you're going to get a large chunk, if not all of it, if you look a little bit, of uh, Plymouth Plantation. You can look at it. It's all there. It's super cool. Um, so, who were these people and why did they come to North America? Well, first of all, we know that one of the main reasons they came was in order to have the opportunity to 
uh, advance the gospel of the kingdom of Christ, as they said. That was their goal. And recognize that they said, yea, though they, the pilgrims, should be even but as stepping stones unto others for the performing of so great a work. Stepping stone lies on the ground, in the mud. And you walk on it to make your way easier and to stay out of the mud. But that means the stepping stone gets dirty. It lays down, in one sense, it lays down its life. Um, some have compared um, that, and I certainly, that is a word picture. Uh, other people have done that in history. During World War I, for example, um, there were times when large numbers of troops needed to move across an area that was mired with barbed wire and, and a lot of it. Uh, barbed wire was actually invented largely during that war. And uh, the British and the Americans would often, whoever reached it first, would throw themselves across the barbed wire so that other men could climb over their bodies in order to get at their objective. This was important because they were under fire. They were in, usually in no man's land where there was very little cover, and you had plunging fire and interlocking uh, ranges of fire uh, from opposing enemy positions. And so you did not want to hang out there. The longer you spent, the more lives were lost. And so the men who were first to the wire laid down their bodies and often their lives so that others could cross over and reach the objective and uh, perhaps their lives would be spared. That is the picture that Bradford is laying out here. You have to understand that, number one, they had been told that the people who lived in North America were little better than animals. Now, that is racist, but that is also what they were told, and that was, that was the account they had. Bradford and the rest of the pilgrims were among the first to recognize that that is not true, and that these people are human beings just like us, and that they need the gospel. In fact, they recognized that before they arrived, that, well, I don't know what's going on, but these people need Jesus. They are people. And even though we're being told that they are, quote-unquote, little better than animals, we are willing to lay down our lives to bring the gospel to them. That is not racist. That is love for your fellow man. It is love for your neighbor. And in fact, it is going out and seeking them out and being willing to live next to them to tell them the gospel. But they also knew that that could come at tremendous cost. Men can do horrible things to each other. Europeans do horrible things to each other. And so it was not hard to imagine that perhaps the tales that they had been told that there were cannibals living in North America were true. It was not so very hard to believe because they were only a few hundred years removed from their own ancestors being cannibalistic. The Celts sometimes were. They certainly had human sacrifice. Uh, the Germans certainly were. And the Norsemen, uh, the Nordic peoples, the Vikings, not necessarily your friendliest types, right? So um, it wasn't hard to imagine that, yeah, I'll bet the people without Christ that live in the New World can be barbaric. That is not a statement on their race. It is a statement on their lack of Christ. And they were told that these barbarians that live in the uh, uninhabited or very little inhabited wilds of North America um, are not only cannibals, but they are brutal. They will cut parts of your body off you and cook them and eat them while you watch. Did that kind of thing happen among Native Americans, among Indians, as they were called by other first settlers because of Christopher Columbus' mistake that uh, he thought he'd reached India? Uh, well, uh, you can certainly find uh, examples of horrific tortures that were viewed very differently by the people that were here, but that certainly are not consistent with a Christian worldview, and in fact, practices which the Native Americans swore off as they found Christ. Now, modern Americans love, and Marxists in particular, love to focus on the abuses, especially on the abuses of white people towards uh, Native Americans, um, towards the Indian peoples. Now, that term Native American is certainly something, these are people who had lived here for a long time and had lived here for longer than the European settlers who arrived, the explorers. That is true. So within that context, okay, that's a fine word. But then you have to dig into it and say, yeah, but there are all kinds 
of examples and historically documented things that are just as much or more documented than anything we know about the Native American peoples before um, the majority of the white uh, explorers arrived, because that is all based on oral tradition. And even as part of that oral tradition from who we would call Native Americans, there are tales of blonde-haired, blue-eyed Native American tribes that lived out in the middle of the continent. And those persisted even up to and past the Lewis and Clark expedition. These are not just wild tales. There are uh, admittedly um, oral traditions, but still, um, it depends on what you like. If it, if it lines up with a Marxist perspective, then oral, believing oral traditions is the only thing you can do if you're not a racist. But if it doesn't line up with their perspective, they're going to tell you, well, you can't believe that. That's just oral tradition. But among those oral traditions are tales of people who spoke Welsh. They were Celtic speakers. So you have to ask the question, well, how did the people we think of as Native Americans arrived here? Well, they got here from somehow, somewhere. They got here somehow. And why is it that they, there are remarkable similarities between the people that inhabited this part of the world when my ancestors arrived here and the people that inhabit, say, Siberia, who are not Slavic? And so, yes, they, everybody arrived here somehow. And so to say that, well, there couldn't possibly be any, any blue-eyed, blonde-haired, maybe even Welsh-speaking people who lived here and have lived here for hundreds and hundreds of years, well, of course, it's possible. That's absurd. Uh, it's absurd to say that it's not. And so I want to acknowledge that and just say that, okay, well, we can talk about that. That doesn't mean that there weren't European settlers who mistreated people uh, who had a different skin color and who had lived here for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. Um, no, that absolutely did happen. But that's the remarkable thing about the story of the pilgrims. It's why it's worth celebrating. It's why we need to tell the Marxists, no, stop trying to sell your own ideas by lying about history. There's plenty of history to focus on. We need to be honest about it. And the pilgrims are a remarkable example of an, a, an appropriate way of behavior. Um, and so let's go back a little bit and ask, why were these people coming? Well, most people know that the pilgrims came here for freedom, specifically religious freedom, you see, and same with the pilgrims. They would have been called separatists. Now, in the eyes of many people, they would not see a difference between the people who came and settled at, Ply in, at Plymouth and the people who settled, say, at Salem, the Puritans. In fact, they were close together. The Puritans had come a few years before and had set up uh, a, a colony, um, and it was all called, well, and before that, and I'm sorry, I'm, I misstated that. The, uh, there were Puritans who came here largely. They were um, roundhead cavaliers, and they settled in uh, where Jamestown is. Um, there would be later pilgr pilgrims who came and settled at Salem. I think I said that Salem was, uh, had arrived. They arrived a few years uh, after the uh, pilgrims landed at Plymouth. Um, but they were all Puritans. They would have been considered Puritans, and in fact, for the most part, especially from our perspective, even the pilgrims would be considered. But during their time, the pilgrims would, were called separatists, and the primary difference, the Puritans believed that they could apply the Bible to the Church of England, to the Anglican Church, and that that would change. They could change it from the inside. And in fact, it had large, it had been changed from the inside massively since the time of Luther and, and moving forward, 100 years before, previous. Um, and so the principles of the Reformation had been reforming the Anglican Church, but it was a hard slog. And by the early 1600s, there was still great persecution because you would have the next king would come along. In this case, it was James I of England, James VI of Scotland, and he would bring back a Romish or a Popish perspective. And so... Um, it was this seesaw battle back and forth. And eventually you had people who said, we cannot purify the church. We must separate in order to serve God faithfully and obey the Bible. So they were called separatists. And that is what William Bradford and the people who came with him or who brought him, depending on how you look at it, to the new world. Um, and so they ended up um, forming their own illegal churches, and they were put in prison for doing so in England in the late 15 and early 1600s. Um, they were chased and harassed through the land. 
Um, they uh, withstood several different uh, monarchies and different persecutions. And so that is a fascinating period. This is the same p- time period when you have the Scotch Covenanters, uh, the Scottish Covenanters, and you have the um, the uh, actions and activities in uh, Switzerland under Calvin, that it is the Protestant Reformation. Well, this is what it looked like in England. And eventually, the people who were separatists started saying, where can we go to find freedom to serve God without being put in jail for going to church? And uh, eventually, they were offered an opportunity to leave England and go to Holland, which was largely agnostic. Now, that doesn't mean the agnostic the way it is today. It was culturally Christian and actually even culturally Reformed. There is a reason why the color orange is considered a Reformed color or a Reformation or a Presbyterian color, and the color green is considered a Catholic or Popish or Romish color. And that comes from partially from Ireland, but the color orange and the reality that in Ireland is still considered uh, Protestant, it comes from Holland. The Prince of Orange uh, eventually uh, became uh, King of England. Um, and that was that's uh, William, and he uh, that started was called the Glorious Revolution or Bloodless Revolution, and um, so that whole that entire concept meant that Reformed peoples knew that we could go to Holland, and so they ended up going to Holland, and uh, they lived there for several years. Um, I believe it's pretty close. I'd have to look it up, but you're talking around a decade, maybe a little more. During this time, their children continued to grow, and uh, they were faced with a culture that was not, what was, what was not, they didn't care. You could have your own church, that's fine. Um, but the culture was also not really interested in Christ, and some of their children were leaving because uh, the pilgrims had to work so hard in Holland that they did not have time to spend with their children, and their children were leaving the faith. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? They could not depend on the church. They could not depend on the, their culture. They could not depend on things to bring up their own children. They were working so hard just to feed their children uh, that they they really were not able to bring them up. They grew up in the street to some extent. And so they said, we have to change this. We have to go somewhere. We have to do something to fix this problem. And so they began looking to the new world where they knew there would be people who, as Bradford said, would eat their flesh in front of them while they lived. That's what they were told would happen. And they said, we are willing to undertake it so that our children will grow up to know God, so that we will have the freedom to serve him and worship him in all of life, and so that we can bring the gospel to these poor people who do not know God and do not know that cannibalism is not only a sin before God because it involves murder, uh, but because it is also horribly destructive to the individuals. And so they arrived here through a series of harrowing experiences, uh, many of them having died on the ship, or several of them having died on the ship, and having had sickness and you can imagine being cooped up in a boat that is about the size of your living room, dining room, and kitchen put together. Um, they were down in the hold of this thing right on top of one another for uh, almost two months through terrible weather in the North Atlantic. And so, yeah, pretty rough time. Because of the delays and the problems they had in Holland, they did not arrive here until nearly winter, the end of November. And they have no food. They are, and they were, because of storms, they were blown further north. They intended to land down by Jamestown, which is near Williamsburg, Virginia. It's current day, uh, present day Williamsburg, Virginia. Jamestown is still there. You can go see it. Um, but instead, they were blown north and landed uh, near Boston, where Boston, Massachusetts is now. Now, that was all still called Virginia, but they looked at that and said, hmm, well, this must be northern Virginia. No one, We have no maps that really show us anything here. This is completely unknown to us. We don't know what's out there, but we have to get off this ship. Problem is, it's near Boston. Have you ever been to Boston in the late fall? Uh, it's cold and wet. And so they land. Uh, they form Plymouth Plantation. And um, they begin to try to build enough shelter for themselves. Now, of course, m- most of us know the story. Most of us know that uh, a, va- a lot of them died. 
uh, around half of the pilgrims died and you had whole families that were wiped out. You had some families where all the children died. You had some families where everyone but one child died. You had families where the parents died and the children were left orphaned. You had uh, husbands who lost their wives, and in fact, that was a very common occurrence because men are, in at least in that time and in many cases, are uh, better able to withstand brutal hardships, living nearly outside in exposure because you can't build a snug warm house when the ground is frozen and you have limited time and you have to do it all. It's very challenging. Um, and so that first winter was called the dying time. And there are many remarkable providences of God. Um, they had a hard time finding anyone who lived anywhere. They, they found abandoned villages of, obviously this is human habitation. They found food stores, no one around. Um, they found trails. They found obvious areas of cultivation. Now, they didn't know that they were being watched through the winter, but it was largely by the next tribe over. Where they landed happened to be where the Patuxets were, and most of those people had tragically died of disease and through warfare by from the warring tribes. Now, um the vast majority of the peoples who lived in that area were related and uh, of the native americans they would they had similar language groups and they were considered um interrelated the way norwegians swedes and danes are considered to be interrelated that is the algonquin tribe um, the patuxets were part of the wampanoag um, confederation and by the time the pilgrims got here as far as we know and it's fairly well documented there was one patuxet left in the entire world his name was Tisquantum, or as the europeans heard him say squanto and so that is what he's been known in uh, in english for a long time uh, we believe that Tisquantum would be a much closer um much closer to what he would have called himself he had been captured and taken away as a slave in a, in a remarkable, well, not so remarkable, but a stunning example of uh, Westerners mistreating people here, taken to Europe, learned English, uh, and then was bought by Spanish uh, Roman Catholic monks and freed and taken care of and eventually found a berth and made it back here before the pilgrims arrived. When he left, his people were here. When he got back, they were all dead. There was nothing but bones. It is a shocking adventure story and one of the most amazing. I mean, you talk about Count of Monte Cristo. Um, the story of Tisquantum is something else. Well, he was taken in by the neighboring tribe, um, the Massachusetts. They would have said Massachusetts or Massachusetts, and that's the tribe for which they were named, for which the state is named. Um, and so, but they were uh, governed by Massasoit. Um, the Massachusetts is how they would have said. The Massachusetts dialect uh, is that group of, of languages. Um, and the Massachusetts tribe took um, Tisquantum in, and he lived with them for the remainder of his life, as far as we know. But he spoke English. And through the winter, he was tasked to watch these settlers that had arrived just where his people had lived. Um, which was some distance from where Massasoit's main tribe was. Massasoit was the, we call him Massasoit. We're not really sure what his personal name was. Massasoit ends up with his title, um, uh, meaning uh, ruler or supreme uh, chief of chiefs uh, would be the, the concept. Um, and uh, of the particularly his specific tribe, they were all Massachusetts, but his specific tribe was Wampanoag. Um, so they took in the, the last remaining Patuxet because they were part of the same confederation. And um, they observed the pilgrims through that winter. Well, the pilgrims didn't know. They couldn't see anyone. They knew this land had been inhabited. Um, they were worried about taking the grain that they found, but they looked around. They tried to find the owners. They couldn't find anyone. Their children were starving. And so they took it. 
and they fed their families. Later, they found out who it belonged to. There was it was a store of of grain that was un uh, it was out away from everyone else. We're not really sure why, but once they found out that oh, we think that that belonged to these people, they paid them, and they paid them what they wanted to be paid. They paid fair value. Um, but through that winter, there was barely enough food. There was not enough food. They were dying of starvation. They were dying of illness. And uh, the pilgrims, the separatists, the Brad Plymouth Plantation, um, buried their people at night in order to keep up some form of appearance because they didn't know if they were being watched uh, by uh, hostile people who might attack at any moment. And so they did not want to appear weak. Um, they continued striving and trying to just eke out a living through that winter. Now, one of the most remarkable things I mentioned earlier, when they got there, they arrived in what uh, Western European thinkers had theorized about, but no one had ever seen, called a state of nature, not in the sense of not having clothing, which is sometimes how it's used today, but in a political sense. They arrived here and there was no other established government. And in fact, they did not even have warrant from the king to settle where they settled. They had warrant from the king of England uh, to settle near Jamestown. And But they couldn't get there. They would die if they tried. And so they said, well, for now, we are without man-made government. So the first thing we need to do is figure out how we're going to do that. And it had long been theorized that if human beings found themselves without an existing government, then it was their responsibility to covenant together and to make one under the authority of God, because God has all authority from their perspective and from mine. And he delegates that authority to the body, the group of individuals who are there, the people. And those people, according to the laws of God, then uh, elect who will be, who will bear that authority for the community. This is a specific and very well uh, drawn up and thought out and spelled out system. It's just no one had really ever done it because Europeans couldn't remember a time when they got to a place as a group and said, we don't have any government. And so it's exactly what they did. They formed the Mayflower Compact. And we, we tend to think about the Mayflower as a bunch of separatists. Well, that's not true. They weren't rich enough to buy their own ship. They were able to secure passage on a ship that was going. And there were a lot of, there were plenty of other people. They were still a minority. Um, they were called strangers or outsiders to buy the, by the pilgrims. In other words, meaning they aren't part of our church. But they're, they're still here. They're still Englishmen. And they have their own perspective. Most of them were some kind of not really practicing Anglicans, adventurers. Some of them were rough. Some of them were scoundrels. Some of them were criminals. And um, this is where they were. And so when they got there, they said, well, we aren't just the, uh, just the just people in this church. Uh, the biblical term for people who are saved by the grace of God and part of a church is saint. And, the, and they referred to the people who weren't part of their church and weren't really part of any church practicing as strangers. And they said in their own language, in their own words, um, our government must provide for both saint and stranger. And so the majority voted and came up with this compact. And the strangers looked around and said, well, we were in the minority, but we are being our rights are being recognized. And so they went along with it. Well, uh, there were many different examples of the strangers who were in the same boat. They were having the same trouble. They were dying at the same rates. There were very few women and children. They were mostly men. Um, but these men um, were not willing to play ball. They, there, was, there were t examples of theft. There were examples of, of things. And now, obviously, it wasn't perfect. Um, no, no one in the church was perfect either, in the, the separatist church of the, of the pilgrims. Um, but they had a framework for dealing with one another, and they took care of the strangers in the same way. Um, they absolutely took care of them, provided for them, and made sure that um, everything was, as, as much as possible, was, uh, was they were provided for, and that there was a, a, an economy of sorts. It wasn't a rich economy, but it was still an economy because you have two people. Um, and in fact, you can argue that one person has to have an economy because you have limited resources that have multiple uses. And so, and if you don't know what that is, you need to read Thomas Sowell's Basic Economics. Um, but there were many examples for uh, such as, what do you do with Sunday? Sunday, according to the Reformed, and especially the early Reformed, the early Protestant perspective, is the Sabbath. And they were Sabbatarian. They believed that you did not work on Sunday, even if, even if you were starving. You did not go and work. You worshiped God. And so 
there were times when the strangers who weren't about to go to church would be out recreating on Sunday, which was from the pilgrim's perspective against the law. But the pilgrims said, well, uh, we're not going to go out and try to make them do things. That would be outside our jurisdiction. If they were part of our church, then we would exercise church discipline, but we are not going to exercise the power of the state, which the Mayfire Compact did give the people who led the state, who were elected by the majority, um, who were um, members of the Pilgrim's Church. They said, no, we're not going to go and use the civil authority to make these guys go to church. But the problem was the the strangers wanted to be outside playing rough, rowdy games. Um, There were many different games at the time. Um, we could talk about them. They're interesting. Some people played them right up until the mid 1800s, even up till 1900 and later, the same types of games, um, physical, rowdy, loud games. And so the pilgrims are in their church trying to worship and it's, <laughs> there's a loud, you know, the equivalent of a loud football match going on outside. Um, so yes, football is part of Thanksgiving. Although if it's supplanting Thanksgiving, you have a problem. Um, and so the, at one point Bradford went out and took away the things they were playing with and said, okay, look, we're going to put these over here. You guys can play whatever you want. You can do whatever you want, but you have to respect what we're doing over here. And you can't disrupt it any more than we are going to come out and demand that you do things in a a specific way. You are by default demanding that we do them that way. And so we will respect your, your right as a, as someone who believes something different, not to participate in what we're doing, but we also will expect you not to disrupt what we are doing. That is one of the earliest examples of the American perspective on liberty and freedom and how it is supposed to work. Um, and that is a remarkable, remarkable example. One of the other very remarkable, distinctly American things that came from Plymouth was that eventually, especially that first winter and then through the next hundred years, because there were times when due to sinfulness on both sides, um, there would be friction and sometimes violence between the Western Europeans and the Native Americans. And so it very quickly became necessary that the civil government in Massachusetts mandate that all men, whenever they went anywhere, especially to any gathering, bring their fire locks or firearms. At that time, it was called a fire lock because you had a metal tube that was the barrel of a gun with a hole drilled on the end, kind of like a cannon, like when you watch Bugs Bunny, except it's small and long and skinny. It looks like a big musket. It was called an arquebus. Um, and used gunpowder to fire a projectile, but they didn't have flint on them. That was not developed yet. They had a smoldering wick um, that it was in a little hinging thing so that when you pulled on the lever, it shoved that uh, smoldering wick down into the hole and lit off the matchlock. That's why it's called the matchlock. And in fact, there are still popular works of, of fiction from that era. One of them is called the matchlock gun. Um, and so this is the early 1600s. They were all required to bring their fire locks to church and they would stack them in the corner and their locks, you had to light that wick. If you wanted to be able to shoot, you had to light it and you didn't have a match the way we think of it. It was called a match lock because it had a burning wick on it. Well, if you want that wick, what do you have to do? I mean, you probably have to get your flint and, get your flint and tinder out and strike a fire on a little bed of tinder and light it up and then light, everybody has to light their wick. And it was a very slow burning thing. You have to understand, have you ever, you, you know, the idea that Blackbeard braided his, Blackbeard the pirate braided his beard. It was plated, as they would have called it, not P L A I G H T, plated, and or P L I T A I T. The reason they did that is because they would braid wicks into their beards that was right there and they could light them and they would hang here and then they could light the cannon with it. I know that sounds bizarre, but that is part of the legend of, of English pirates from the 15 and 1600s. Well, so when you went to church in Plymouth, there would be a stack of muskets that were all smoldering in the corner. And uh, you had to be fairly careful and make sure you didn't set one off. But I'm sure church smelled interesting because you'd have the smell of cotton rope and gun and gunpowder burning very slowly. Um, or at least saltpeter, over in the corner. But this idea that Americans carry guns goes back to the very beginning. And it was in fact mandated at that time that if you didn't carry a gun, you would have to pay a fine, which would then be used specifically to buy guns for people who didn't have them. 
And so you could petition for saying, look, I just don't have the money to buy a gun. And then the tax would not be levied. There was a process for establishing that, okay, this person can't, and therefore the state will provide one for them. Um, but if you were, you, if you had the means to have a match lock or a fire lock and you did not have it, or you did not carry it regularly, you could be fined. Um, <laughs> so we can talk about whether that's a good idea, whether that's, that's the role of government. But I would argue that government is there to protect one citizen from the other, to safeguard the rights of all citizens. And if someone is, is violating the rights of another, then that needs to change. And so they made an argument, and I think it's a legitimate argument, you could debate it, that if, you're, if you fail to carry your match lock, you are endangering the lives of other people. So that's an interesting thing. I'm not sure I agree with it, but I think it's a fun debate. Um, what about the relationship between the pilgrims and the Indians? Well, we've touched on it briefly and noted that when the pilgrims arrived here, they expected to find people who were had sunk so low that they were they acted like animals. And what they found was a highly developed society with its own laws. Certainly, many of those laws would be contrary to uh, Western jurisprudence and to a biblical understanding of civil government, but they had order. They had rulers. They had civilization. They were a farming people. They were not hunter-gatherers. They were agricultural. In fact, they were so advanced agriculturally that the uh, Europeans had to learn a thing or three, and so they didn't starve, and that's where the entire concept of Thanksgiving comes from, because after the, after the dying times, um, when, when they lost nearly half of the people, or yeah, about half, um, then the next year they had food in abundance. And that is because uh, that spring, after the dying time, uh, Tisquantum decided to go into town. At the, at the, apparently, it appears, when Massasoit, the, the chief of chiefs, told him to. Um, and so he approached and said, welcome, Englishmen. And the Puritans, or the pilgrims, could not believe that someone was here speaking English. And they quickly learned that God had sent that guy to Europe, and he had learned English and come back. And it was not a good thing, in, in, any better than it was good a good thing for Jacob, uh, or excuse me, for Joseph to have been kidnapped by his brothers in the biblical story and sent to Egypt. But God used that to provide for the people of God. And in fact, the pilgrims noted that this is, that's remarkable. That is, that is, it blows, it blew them away. They couldn't believe it. And so... Um, even though it was not a good thing, what did Joseph say? What you intended for evil, saying, talk, speaking to his captors, God intended for good. And it appears to Squantum actually recognized that, and he confessed Christ, and uh, as far as we know, became a Christian. Um, because of the way the pilgrims comported, or uh, they would have said comported, or because of the way they acted, the way they comported themselves. Um, and so you have this remarkable attitude that the pilgrims who were afraid that when they saw a Native American, they would probably be killed and eaten. At least it was possible. And yet when they did see the one, he was speaking English and there to help them. And that was early spring in New England, which is a beautiful time. Things are starting to grow out of the ground. You can go out and pick food. And you know why we have dandelions in America? They are not an American species. They're invasive. They're also very useful. I know you hate them in your yard, and I understand. Europeans brought those here because they will flower every single month out of the year if they possibly can. They are prolific, and they grow a green which is high in all kinds of excellent nutrients. It doesn't taste very good, but when you come out of a winter of starving to death, you, what you really want is something green full of iron and minerals and nutrients, and you can go and get those dandelions and they grow one of the first things to pop out of the ground. I used to live on the same latitude as Boston in the middle of America in South Dakota and the Great Plains. Um, arguably the weather's a little harsher there because we don't have the ocean. And one of the first thing that pops out of the ground is dandelions. And so that's why, but there are lots of other uh, indigenous things that grow here and you can start picking them and they started trying to eat them. And, you know, as, as they had, they, this was not different from Europe. Northern Europe is the same. You can starve to death there too. And many people did. Their ancestors did. They did sometimes in like in Holland when they didn't have money. And so, but Tisquantum started teaching them how to plant things. They used the three sisters, which if you haven't, don't know what that is, you should Google it. It's corn or maize beans and pumpkins or squash 
and grown together on one hill. They are remarkably symbiotic, and you fertilize it with fish because you're on the ocean. And so uh, Tisquantum showed them how to plant, how to grow things in this climate. And by the end of the year, they had so much plenty that they could host, have a big party, and all eat their fill, which was an unbelievable luxury. Um, through that summer, and then for decades to come, the pilgrims, the separatists, treated their Native American neighbors with utmost respect. They respected their land. Um, where they were living, the Indians all actually acknowledged nobody that nobody owns it. Nobody owns all of that. Just quantum owned part of it. Nobody owns all of it. Just quantum actually lived there with them for quite a while on the land that he grew up on, but he did not claim all of it. That was not the way they thought. And so they lived on land that was abandoned, that was no man's land. When they wanted more, they bought it from the, uh, from the uh, Wampanoag tribes. Um, when they wanted, when there were things that needed to go on, they treated the Wampanoags as a neighboring people, as their own separate uh, nation. Um, and they bartered with them and negotiated with them uh, the way y- y- they would have done with their European neighbors. And this was better then the other Algonquin tribes treated the, the Wampanoags. The Wampanoags themselves were greatly depleted uh, by the same disease and also um, in the, uh, because of wars with the other Algonquins. Um, and in, in fact, in, uh, there were times when the uh, neighboring unfriendly tribes would raid and Massasoit would call on his European neighbors for support. And they would look into it and say, well, what is the history of this war? Is this just defense? And they lived out everything that they said they believed. And when it was appropriate for them to defend their their neighboring, uh, their allied nation, the Wampanoags, they did. And it turns out the Europeans were pretty good warriors. Uh, They knew what they were doing, and they had some pretty great weapons. And so... The entire story of Thanksgiving is a model of how it should look in America, how it should have looked and how it did look there. Now, that doesn't mean there weren't problems. There were other Reformed, other Protestant peoples who arrived here at calling themselves Puritans, stole from the Native Americans, uh, mistreated them, eventually led to bloodshed. Um, And so there certainly is a checkered past, checkered history. But that is the case in all cases. That's exactly the point. The point isn't that, well, Europeans didn't act perfectly. Well, wait a minute, who said they did? There are people who've claimed that, and that's laughable. Of course, Europeans acted incorrectly when they didn't follow what God's moral standard is for treating other people. They were wrong, and that led to a lot of problems. And then you have the story of the West, when people pushed further inland. You have many examples of people Uh, treating the people who lived here well. And then you have many examples of people mistreating them. Um, That is a reality. When my ancestors arrived in the West, they bought land from the native peoples, and eventually they sold it back to them when they wanted it back. Um, And that is part of the picture. And so we have to recognize that there is a way for Europeans to live alongside people who are probably from Eurasia or, or parts of Asia um, who came here the other way, probably across, fr- across from Russia into Alaska and down. At least most people believe that's how the Native Americans first got here. Well, of course there's a way for us to all get along. Of course there's a way to function. And to say that, well, no European could set foot here without stealing land from Native Americans, that's laughable. <laughs> you mean no one lived here? There were no human beings here before the people we call Native Americans got here? Seriously doubt that. I seriously doubt that. That is a, that is a laughable claim. It is improbable. Um, and there is certainly no evidence for it. And so it, it is necessary to, to know something about the history of your, of your people and the people who have become part of your people that would be American Indians or Native Americans who are Americans, Native Americans, and who enjoy the blessings of liberty, who lived, in some cases, in very, very bad situations. You can look at 
the Shoshone people and the Crow, who were horribly persecuted, the Nez Perce, horribly persecuted by other tribes, hunted nearly out of existence. I was born close to, and my, my family was born on, the um, Lakota uh, Sioux Reservation called the Pine Ridge, which is a horrible situation and a horrible setup. The federal government has horribly mistreated uh, the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota peoples. Um, they were once a very proud people that governed, and that, well, in, the, in one sense, possessed uh, much of the Great Plains. But the way they got that was by kicking the other people out. The Crow that lived in the Black Hills, the Shoshone, the uh, um, Nez Perce, who lived a little bit further west, were all nearly hunted out of existence by, unfortunately, the Lakota, who they called the Sioux, which means snake. Um, that's why the Sioux tribes don't like to be called Sioux. That was the term that their enemies used for them. So let's not imagine that human beings who just happened to live here before the majority of Western Europeans arrived here were somehow perfect. Sorry, Dances with Wolves is not true. Um, so... It's important to recognize that mankind is fallen and sinful and mistreats. If we are not following the law of God, then we mistreat the other people. The second great commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. And in fact, if you do not love your brother, you cannot claim to love God, according to the Bible. And that is not unique to Europeans. In fact, that is not only a racist comment to claim that Europeans have Christianity and no one else does. That is racism. It's also ridiculous. Last I checked, and as people like to remind us, Jesus was not a Western European, not in his physical form, and not certainly he didn't come from here. He came from heaven. Uh, hello. So it's important to recognize these realities and to, and to uh, acknowledge that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ applies to everyone. The opportunity is for everyone, and in fact, it is a lie of Satan, often promulgated by Marxists, that somehow Christianity is at war and is a particular, specifically a white thing, and is at war with color with people of any different color. That's laughable. Massasoit is laughing at you. Disquantum is laughing at you. The, the, the vast majority of uh, the of American Indians through all time are laughing at you. It's absurd because. They were professing Christians. So after, after they were exposed to Christianity, um, my ancestors, the wild Celts who burned people alive, and my ancestors, the wild Germans, who were probably cannibalistic, are laughing at you too because they are thankful, as I am thankful, that Christ was brought to them. So why do we celebrate Thanksgiving? We are thankful to God for his provision. We are thankful to God for the Son, for his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, for his shed blood, for the fact that we have the opportunity to participate, and for this great adventure we call life. You want to know about the great, some of the greatest adventures of all times? Read about the pilgrims. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.